Hey, what's up? And welcome to the Nutrition Kitchen, the science behind. I'm with my nutrition guru, Sarah Pak. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So let's talk peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Show me what you cooked up with Chef Poulard. Uh, so I got my level one here, uh, my typical peanut butter and jelly with white bread. Uh, and then I have my level two, uh, which is the open face sandwich with 100% whole grain bread, natural peanut spread, and fresh fruit. And then my level three here is uh, sweet potato toast, peanut only peanut butter, and fresh fruit. All right, well, let's start with the level one bread. A good start to understanding nutrition is by knowing what foods are made of and how foods are processed. Uh, so what's the white bread made of then? Well, let's take a look at the ingredients list. The first ingredient is enriched wheat flour. Any guesses, Keon, on how we get from intact whole grains to this? Maybe a big grinder? Actually, if this were 100% wheat flour, you could be right. But enriched flour under undergoes more processing or refining. Let's talk about what wheat is, then how it's processed. Whole grain wheat kernels have three parts, the bran, germ, and endosperm. The bran is a series of outer protective layers. Since it's the part of the kernel closest to the outside world, the bran is where most of the defense mechanisms are. It has both structural defenses, like a series of tough walls rich in fiber, and chemical defenses called phytochemicals. These defenses help protect against damage from insects, bacteria, and radiation from the sun. The germ is the baby seed that will eventually grow into the new plant. The endosperm is a fuel tank providing energy for the germ to grow. But the milling process, essentially a giant grinder that produces refined flour, strips the grain kernels of the bran and germ, leaving only the endosperm. So what's the point of stripping those parts off the kernel? Most oils, including the fats and wheat germs, spoil when exposed to air, light, moisture, or bacteria. Removing the germ with its oils gives the flour a longer shelf life and removing the bran leads to a softer, more desirable texture. So refined flour has a longer shelf life and better texture. Um, what's the downside? Well, it turns out the germ and bran are loaded with beneficial nutrients, including omega-3 fats, fiber, vitamins, minerals, and beneficial phytochemicals. The milling process strips refined flour of both the germ and bran, which contains over 75% of those nutrients and the benefits that come with them. For example, fiber is amazing. It helps to promote gut health, regulate weight, and reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and more. The nutrition of wheat and most other food is very complex, but we'll keep it simple. Just remember, refined flours have less nutrients due to more processing. I like keeping it simple, and you keep talking about um, refined flours, but it's called enriched on the ingredient list. So what does that mean? Refined flour is a general term to describe any processed flour with nutrients removed. Enriched flour is a specific term defined and enforced by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration called a standard of identity. Think of it as a food definition. The standard of identity or food definition for enriched flour is the same as it is for flour in that both must have the bran removed and most have the germ removed also. So they are both refined flours, but enriched flour also means a few of the nutrients removed in processing are added back into the flour, usually by using synthetic versions in powder form. You can find these listed on the label in parentheses right after the word enriched flour. But what gets added back through enrichment represents a small fraction of the nutrients lost through refining. Okay, so enriched flours are refined flours, uh, just with a few nutrients added back. But you said regular flour is refined too, is that right? Yes, enriched flour, flour, white flour, wheat flour, and plain flour are all refined flours by definition. And you can easily search for all of these on the nutrient label ingredient list. Since enriched flour is the most common refined flour in packaged foods, that term we will use most often. Got it. Uh, I'll make sure I avoid enriched flour. So what ingredient does our level two bread have? 
whole wheat flour. Unlike refined flours, whole wheat flour has just as much germ and bran as the intact whole wheat it came from. So it keeps all of those beneficial nutrients. Whole wheat flour should be the first and only flour ingredient. There should be no enriched flour, flour, white flour, wheat flour, or even plain flour listed as an ingredient. Okay, uh, thanks for the tip. So can you show me on this ingredients list? Okay, here's your 100% whole grain bread. No enriched flour, less processing, more nutrients. Definitely an upgrade. But there are still a lot of chemistry terms there, right? For example, a lot of preservatives are used here. Why do they add all that? Ever heard the term day-old bread? Bread isn't supposed to stay fresh at room temperature, so they add all this junk to keep it from spoiling and to keep its texture. It's great for the shelf, but not so much for your gut or your health. And here's the thing about 100% whole wheat bread. It's still made from flour, which is more processed. So even though it has beneficial nutrients, our body absorbs it differently than the intact whole grain wheat kernel the flour came from. As an example, breads made from refined flours and breads made from 100% whole grain flours both raise blood sugar far more than bread with some intact whole grains. But to be clear, 100% whole wheat bread is still an upgrade over white bread. Okay, so that's why we have an open face sandwich then. Only one slice so we don't raise our blood sugar too much. Is that right? That's one of the many reasons. It's just one example of an upgrade that makes a difference. If you can upgrade from white bread to 100% whole wheat bread, if you already eat 100% whole wheat bread, you can upgrade to an open face sandwich, or you could even upgrade to a frozen bread without preservatives, or 100% whole wheat bread with some intact whole grains included. Yeah, who knew there were so many options for bread? Uh, what about our level three option, the sweet potato toast? Can you tell me a little bit about that? In general, sweet potatoes are minimally processed and there are plants, which are common features of high level foods. They are rich in nutrients such as fiber, vitamins, minerals, and beneficial phytochemicals. Sweet potatoes have a lot of starch, but consuming sweet potatoes actually stabilizes blood sugar and helps insulin work better. Just goes to show you the importance of the whole food package and that not all carbohydrates are the same. So they're high in carbs and level three. That's what I like to hear for sure. Uh, I gotta keep that energy up. So let's talk about the other ingredients. What about our peanut butter? Well, let's take a look at the ingredient list again. Peanuts are first. That's a whole plant ingredient with protein, fiber, unsaturated fats, minerals, vitamins, and beneficial phytochemicals. Next are fully hydrogenated oils. Uh, well, that doesn't really sound natural. Uh, what are fully hydrogenated oils? Originally, they were vegetable oils, but they were heated under really high temperatures and exposed to a metal catalyst to add hydrogen atoms to the oils, fully saturating the oil with hydrogen. Oh, so let me guess it's a saturated fat then. Yes, technically, you can create a partially saturated or a partially hydrogenated oil if you stop the process halfway but the FDA banned these oils from use in food since January 2021. Hold on, so they banned them? What are those oils called again? Industrial trans fats. They were associated with raising LDL or bad cholesterol and triglycerides while lowering HDL or good cholesterol. They were also associated with increased insulin resistance and cardiovascular disease. Ooh, no wonder they are banned. But you're telling me these fully hydrogenated oils are made the same way, but somehow they're considered safe to eat? Well, they're allowed in food because we don't have proof yet that they are harmful. Unfortunately, highly processed foods are innocent until proven guilty. But it is a highly processed and saturated fat, so I keep my distance. Yeah, that sounds kind of shady to me, not gonna lie. Uh, what's the point of it anyway? Well, mainly to prevent this from happening, when peanut-only peanut butter sits on the shelf for a long time, the oil separates from the ground peanuts. Hmm. Yeah, I can see I can see the oil just sitting at the top there. Yeah, the fully hydrogenated oil acts as a stabilizer and to prevent the separation. Otherwise, you will have to stir it really well. Oh, well, let me try that. Let's see. Oh, yeah, it's kind of kind of tough. 
So my only two options then are to stir my own peanut butter or eat peanut butter that has shady oils in it. <laughs> right, technically, yes. Peanut butter, by definition, either contains only peanuts or if it has a stabilizer, it has to use hydrogenated oils. But the good news is that whatever brand you buy, there's a good chance they offer a natural peanut spread. The FDA is updating their, their definition for natural, but for now it means nothing artificial or synthetic has been included or added. Typically, natural peanut spread is made with palm oil. Oh, so is palm oil an upgrade from the other oils? Unfortunately, palm oil is a highly refined, mostly saturated fat currently harvested in an unsustainable manner. It may increase the risk for plaque forming cholesterol and heart disease. However, since peanuts are a level three food and there's so much more peanut than palm oil, peanut spreads with 90% peanuts are still an upgrade over peanut butter with hydrogenated oils. But the best option is to buy peanut butter made from peanuts only. You may have to switch brands to find peanut only peanut butter. Oh really? So the only thing on this ingredients list is literally roasted peanuts. Um, but that's kind of hard to stir. Well, I'll share you a tip. If you flip the jar upside down, the oil and peanuts will mix, and this makes it easier for you to stir. You just have to leave it for about two days to let it mix. Oh, okay, I'll definitely give that a try. Uh, so what about my grape jelly? Well, what's the first thing listed in the ingredient list? Uh, looks like Concord grapes. That's gotta be a good thing, right? Well, yes, if they actually used grapes but the ingredient list is somewhat misleading. By definition, jelly is made from grape juice, not whole grapes. Making commercial grape juice is a long, complicated process. But to summarize, sugars and waters are squeezed out of the grape. Most of the beneficial nutrients are destroyed during processing, thrown away or used to feed animals. Some of the fiber, called pectin, is actually added back to the jelly to give it its spreadable texture. Well, that sounds kind of nasty. <laughs> and that's not the only thing added. As defined by the FDA, jelly must contain 55% sweetener. So over half of this jar is sugar. Ugh, so jelly is about 45% juice or sugar water, and the other 55% is just sugar. That is not right. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, sounds like this has got to go. Now, jams and preserves include some fruit, but the pits, seeds, skins, cores, or other parts can be removed. And it is still 53 to 55% sugar, so we don't consider it an upgrade. So we upgrade to fresh fruit. Less calories, more nutrients, and less processing. Or mod to frozen fruit, which is usually frozen right after being picked off the plant, so it's also a level three food. Great. Thank you so much, Sara. I learned a lot today. Of course. And gear up for our episode two where we will level up cereal. We're out of here.